Good afternoon, welcome to the Daily Blog Breakfast Club, coming to you live from the Verona Cafe on K Row. Today's agenda topic one: what to make of the Inspector General's report into the leaking of SIS info to Cameron Slater. Topic two: what to make of the report into Judith Collins. And topic three today: what has New Zealand learnt? Post Roastbusters to dissect the issues, blogger and activist Jesse Hume and political commentator and human rights champion Keith Locke. Let's get into issue one. Keith, the PM's office initiates and organises the leak of falsified secret intelligence service information to smear the leader of the opposition on a far right hate blog months out from an election. In other countries, they call that a coup, don't they? Well, I don't know whether it's a coup, but it's certainly uh, gross political interference and parallels have been made with uh, Watergate. Uh, yeah. Essentially, you're politicising the whole, what is supposed to be a neutral process, that is the operations of the SIS. Should the spot, the, the apparatus, the intelligence apparatus system of a state, should it ever be used in a political means like this? Well, historically, uh, around the world, including in America uh, and in Britain, it has been used politically, and uh, Muldoon used it politically in 1981 during the Springbok tour and bringing out a list of people he sort of said were subvers subversives, and that list was supplied by the SIS to him. So yeah. there is a history of it, but since the Muldoon time, there's been... It's part of a bigger development of political figures getting alongside ministers, getting in ministers' offices and, in effect, controlling the state service. I struck that when I was an MP. You know, you'd come up uh, in a select committee against the Ministry of Foreign Affairs heavies or the Defence heavies or whatever, and they'd all be working with the minister to you know, basically not answer the questions and act in a political way. So yeah. that has come over the whole civil service. So when you have Warren Tucker, the head of the SIS, in this report, talking to Phil Dujun, the Deputy Chief of Staff, or John Key, it's a sort of a, a mates, we're working together on this, we're working for a political advantage. Tucker says in one of the critical interviews, uh, this will stop uh, them politis asking political questions in the House. Uh, they, they'll have to call off uh, Annette King yep. and Marion Street. Yep. So acting together in a political way, and that becomes a, a habit, and it's a habit in other government departments too. So it's bigger than the SIS actually, although it's more dangerous in such a secretive institution as the SIS. To release falsified information to smear the leader of the opposition, months out from an election, Labour will say that did have an impact. Goff lost just by a narrow amount. Yes, it could have turned the election. Uh, you can never quite tell, but uh, perceptions count very much. There's uh, a larger question, I think, with the SIS, in that it's subject to different political pressures. Uh, the SIS was effectively set up by British and American intelligence, and ever since, it's sort of run less by the New Zealand government and in terms of its targets and general aims, and more by the Americans, Australians and British. And this is seen even in the latest bill uh, around the, uh, the, the spying and giving them extra powers to, for these terrorist fighters, yeah. even though there's never been a problem in New Zealand and we haven't had any terrorist incidents since the Rainbow Warriors bombed in 1985. The SIS here is driven politically by their counterparts overseas and they're more accountable. The SIS is actually more accountable to the uh, FBI, CIA, in NSA and Washington rather than Wellington, Asia and right? Australia, uh, Washington rather than Wellington, Canberra rather than Wellington. That's another. And then the third political pressure on the SIS is institutional. When you build up all this anti-terrorist capacity, which they have since 2001, you've got to find enemies yep. to justify your job. The budget, sure. So you hear some people raving on about uh, oh these bloody Americans in Iraq and they shouldn't be bombing and. They're Muslims too. Yeah. They might go up and fight for ISIS. So yeah. Yeah. they're exaggerating the them. Jesse, the right will argue that no one cares about dirty politics, that it's only political geeks and beltway freaks that think this is important. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? 
Um, well, I think that it's important that people do care, and I think that it's important that, um, and that, you know, I think political geeks are necessary, but I think it's really important that the mainstream media were a little bit more politically geeky and actually were paying a little bit more attention and, and held them more accountable before the election, not just now. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Chris Finlayson, uh, in his um, uh, interview on The Nation a couple of weekends ago, he pointed out that these new powers won't just be aimed at religious groups, they will be aimed at all activists. Uh, is that a concern as an activist yourself? Absolutely. We had a case in animal rights a few years ago where one of the activists actually was in a live-in relationship with a police informant. Now most of the activism that we do is not terrorism, but it's been framed as that and that's really personally damaging yeah. to people who are everyday people trying to fight problems uh, who end up with a really invasive situation such as a partner living in your home who's an informant. That's so, so invasive and it's absolutely outrageous that the state is responsible for that. Keith, um, Key is about to rush through under urgency. New powers that allow the SIS to break into your home, plant a spy camera and spy on you for 48 hours without a warrant. If they can't be trusted with the power they have right now, why in God's name would we be giving them those sorts of uh, fishing expeditions into people's lives? Yes, well that's one of the points I made when I presented to the select committee on the bill. Very rushed process, all happening in a week and uh, you know, I was informed the night before, would you like to give a submission, 11 o'clock the next day, I'll give it. You know, so it's too rushed, but that's the point uh, I made, that uh, that's the video surveillance power to put a camera in someone's bedroom, living room, backyard, workplace, which is now granted to the secret institution, uh, is the most intrusive form of surveillance, all on the basis of terrorist fighters no one's ever seen a practical example of. And the point I made that you don't undermine such a basic human right as the right to privacy in your own home, uh, unless there's some risk, right? like, I'm not saying that there won't be some bomb let off but it would be very exceptional events. Yes, yes. yes. Know, well, the right to disagree, you know, the yeah. right to carry out, you know, you know, be activists and to disagree and to organise without being, you know, spied upon. Uh, the argument that is being put up, or the defence that's being put up by the government, is you don't need to worry because we will get the warrant if the SIS is going to make, if, if, if they want to reach the evidential threshold. But surely that's only a defence if that's the purpose of what the SIS are doing. If the purpose of what the SIS are doing is just intelligence gathering, yeah. they don't need to reach an evidential threshold, do they? No, no, no that's, that's true. Um, I've so what safeguard is there that the, the, no the buggers won't use there. this? There's, there's, there's very little safeguard even with warrants, really, because it's yes. all done very internally. Rubber stamp, mm. right? And mm. there's such a culture of supporting each other, yes. with, as we've seen within the civil service and the politicians and the overseas agencies that basically drive this whole spy furore. Um, so do you think um, that Muslims are being used as the bogeymen here to be able to grant the secret intelligence service a, a vast erosion of civil liberties to be able to break into it. I mean, you yourself have not, have you not been under the bloody uh, watch of the secret intelligence service since you were a child, were you not? Yeah, well, one of the points I made in my submission yesterday was in uh, 51 years from 1955 to 2006 that they were spying on me every year. Yeah. Um, it was purely because of my political criticisms of the government of the day. There was no hint of illegality. Uh, I haven't got a criminal record. So it was completely because of my criticism of the government and the American government on foreign policy issues. And that's the, that the nature of the SIS. People have to sit down and think. In the whole period the SIS has existed, has it ever provided the main intelligence for the conviction of mm. a single person? The yeah. answer to that, as far as we know, is no. Yeah. Same with the GCSB. So here we're dealing with an organisation which is primarily concerned with looking at people's views, critical of the government, and has, in its whole history, had nothing uh, con constructively to do with criminality, as opposed to the police that are arresting and charging people every day. So the, the fundamental question is, yeah. do we need a separate organisation when the police 
sure, there's some criminality is politically motivated, um, not just criminally motivated, but the police are looking at that already, sometimes uh, excessively, as, mm. as Jesse's pointed out. When you are the enemy of the state, uh, the state surely has become the enemy. Jesse, uh, Cameron Slater has been pretty misogynistic and abusive online. Do you think the Prime Minister should be in regular contact with someone like that? No, and I think with all of these things, it just really highlights the need for me in terms of there, need, there needs to be, I, I think, a code of conduct. And I think there needs to be like an honour code that people um, agree to when they, when, they, when they become part of the government. Uh, yeah. Do you think that it's a good look for the Prime Minister to be the leader of our, of our country, to be in regular contact with someone who has said the most vicious and toxic things probably in the New yeah. Zealand blogosphere environment. Um, no, and I think it just shows that, that we have this kind of uh, excessively casual response to this sort of thing and we don't really, um, you know, in this country there is actually a very, very casual result to this sort of, this treatment towards women and that kind of needs to stop. Yeah, there's two ethical aspects to yeah. uh, Cameron Slater that should put off any politician from working with him. One is He's, he says very openly, and this is stuff quoted in Nicky Huggins, but find the dirt on these politicians, go out actively find the dirt, particularly sexual dirt, yes. and bring them down. And the other thing he says, which is reinforced with the Collins report as well, is he says in one email, if you can't find anything, make it up. Yeah. So he's openly admitting, A, to be a conscious liar yes. yeah. and actually think that's a part of uh, politi the political yes. process and finding sexual dirt on people. Now why should you link up in any way with such a person? Yeah, I mean, uh, where do we start on the ethics of Cameron Slater? <laughs> you know, we don't have it, enough it, time. We, I don't even think, yeah. <laughs> Final question, both of you are uh, on this. Uh, either John Key knew what was going on in his office or he didn't honestly know. So he is corrupt or he is incompetent? Which one? Well, I always give people the benefit of the doubt. So, so grossly he might have, uh, you know, there's, there's the nice <laughs> phrase that came out of the American Nixon stuff and all the rest of it, the plausible deniability. Right. Which means don't tell me uh, and therefore I can't be held responsible. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he may have had that relationship with uh, Phil Jeju and Jason E. if you doing anything, don't tell me. So, But that isn't uh, a I, letter. I, is is, is no, gross no, incompetent no, no. the sort of lady I, you want? I actually don't. I, I actually think it defies belief that any of these people were hanging out with each other, have the same political goals, you know, that they weren't discussing this sort of thing constantly. I just, it defies belief. I can't believe it. Uh, let's move on to issue two. In an attempt to bury all the bad stuff on one day, the government also released a report into Judith Collins over her alleged involvement in taking down the head of the serious fraud office. Jesse, how can this report clear Judith when the terms of reference were incredibly narrow? Collins did in fact discuss issues with Slater and she was just hanging around with people who were planning to smear the head of the serious fraud office. I mean, it may not be a smoking gun, surely it's a smouldering cannon. Yeah, like, it's just as I said, I just don't believe these people were hanging out to it with each other, had the same goals and weren't discussing this sort of thing constantly. I can't believe it. Keith, should the Minister of Justice just be talking with a cabal of right-wing bloggers out to maim the head of the serious fraud office. It's a little bit like her being mates with the mongrel mob, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, I think that's the point. After all of these uh, emails to various people, Kathy Hodges and um, Jared Savage of the Hill and all the rest of it, and in five different emails, he says that Collins is gunning yeah. for this guy. Yes. Yeah. And and the couple, and the couple of them that she wants to bring him down. Now, and then he launches this big account, uh, campaign at the same time as yes. I understand. So Judith Collins, at, at the very minimum, knows he's launching this big campaign. And she's been talking to him on the phone, that's all verified. Yes. And after all these attacks, she talks to him one of the calls, 15 minutes and all the rest of it. 
what was she doing during that period of time to counter what he was doing, given that she was a friend of his? Exactly, and, exactly. And uh, you could argue, see, one of the problems with the report is it argues one way when you could argue the opposite way. It argues that because we can't find evidence that she didn't give him support through the following days and yeah. months, uh, that that means she wasn't trying to undermine him. Whereas you can argue the opposite, that because she saw Cameron Slater conducting this campaign, and people know they're mates because she said it very openly in sure, the past. Sure, that's right, um, that's right. She's always oh, be very careful not to be seen to undermine Adam Feely, but oh well, it's good that old Cameron Slater's having He's a doing go. it for me, yeah, right? And eventually, <laughs> and eventually he resigns. So yes. She wins without a fingers, fingerprints on it. So you, you can argue Should both ways. Should the Justice Minister be hanging out with anyone who's trying to take out the head of his serious fraud office, though? Surely that is a gross oh, but, uh, overstep. Uh, it, but he's a family friend. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final question by the you. Is Colin still a contender for the National Party leadership? Or, or, or is her... Uh, 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 is a credibility boot within the caucus? I, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I, I would suspect that she's not a contender any longer. But um, that's just from all the reactions to the report, etc. I'd say that she's still she's still got support. She's still got supporters inside caucus. Do they are they hoping for a a, 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 a rebirth? Well, I, I think her reputation in the public mind is based on being tough. And yes, single-minded and simplistic solutions, yes. and being tough on board. New Zealanders love that. And but I imagine her colleagues think, well, to really run a country, you've got to have a bit more than tough declarations. So that would be another aspect to the whole thing. Right. Well, she seems to be taking her punishment of being on the back bench pretty lightly. I don't know. I seem to think that she would be the kind of person to rip throats if she thought it was unjust. So she seems to be sitting there. Maybe Just she's going to. Maybe Biden she's going to yeah, migrate to act or something. I don't know. Uh, third issue today, post the decision to not arrest any of the suspects in the Roast Buster case, what needs to change legally and culturally to challenge rape culture in New Zealand? Jesse, you organised uh, petitions and rallies against rape culture. Where do you think we are in terms right now, in terms of progress? Um, well, I think the decision to reopen the review, Amy Adams, Minister Amy Adams reopened the review, the Law Commission review, into trial and pre-trial processes, which is one of our key asks. I think it's a really, really important thing that she's done, and I'm really glad that she was willing to. However, it's just the first step. She's reopened the review, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the government will implement the changes recommended by the review. And I think that's where it's our job as activists not to stand on our haunches, you know, sit on our haunches. We can't lay back. We actually have to be active in trying to get holding the government accountable and making sure they do implement changes that are made. And this is a really, really big issue. And I think what was recently in the media just this last week, which really disturbed and distressed me, was a young girl who was in court and the defence counsel asked her if she considered herself a slut. Now, this is something that if the Law Commission what we, what we think the changes recommended are going to be, if they are implemented, this sort of thing wouldn't be allowed. I mean, that's actually just completely irrelevant um, to a case of rape. Uh, and so, yeah, that sort of thing is still going on now. And so I feel like it really needs to uh, be brought through under urgency. Yeah, because, you know, while we wait, people still are getting hurt in the system. Keith, there is a real not all men dynamic to much of what passes as debate from other men around the issue of rape. With a 1% conviction rate, is it time for men to move beyond that argument? Well, everyone in society has got to play a role in this debate. And uh, I know David Cunliffe got a bit... Uh, he tried, didn't he? Tried, yeah. by, uh, he tried to bring trying it Trying to up. take a bit of responsibility. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that's a, like clearly in Jesse's expert on this. It's a very difficult area to get the evidence and all the rest of it. And uh, I see Jesse blogs on having a more inquisitorial system. You, you, you need uh, clearly a system where a the police react very quickly when they mm. see the signs of things. That's one of the lessons of the roast bars. Yeah, muck around. Um, and you've got to have 
a system that's most shaped towards women being able to tell their story without a comeback, without any embarrassments and all the rest of it. So those are two key things and the whole community, men and women, have to work towards that. What, what, what can men do, do you think, to be part of the solution? I, I don't think it's sort of specifically uh, different from what women do in terms of trying to shape a response, but not running away. How do they away, challenge not, each other? Not, How do they not, challenge each not other? Not ru running, yeah, and, and it's important because a lot of it in the sort of bar rooms and things like that. Yeah. When sexist put downs come up, which includes sort of semi rape yeah. put downs, yeah. that people have got to stand up. So it's like everything, like the campaign against smoking has been driven to mm -hmm. a large extent, not just by law, but by people in peer groups and that saying, no, you've got stupid smoking or yeah. the rest of it. It's got yeah. to be the same thing, we've got to create Can a I dynamic. Just... In male-only groups as well as mixed groups. Can what, I say something what, about that? Yeah, what needs to happen culturally? Do so, you so it's not just culturally. I mean, I think this is the point where the justice system, the police, and the community can, can sort of collide. So right now we have rapes sort of seen as a sort of like mythological thing that happens in dark alleyways by guys that we don't know. Yep. And that's not the reality of it. The reality of it is about 33% of women. About 15% of men have been affected by sexual violence, lots of children have been affected. This sort of thing is really, really common and we need to accept the fact that it is common and it's just due to the fact that it is a community issue. And so what we need to have is justice system processes that actually allow, I guess, uh, sort of like the sexual violence, you know, responses to sexual violence within families, where people who do this sort of thing wrong can actually be met in restorative uh, scenarios with their community, with their own family, with the people around them, and with the people who have been affected and realise that this isn't acceptable and it won't be tolerated by our community. And that also extends to, like Heath was saying, uh, the issue of peers actually saying to one another it, it isn't acceptable. And there have been great success with you know, anti-smoking campaigns, there have been great success with this sort of thing, and that's the sort of thing we need. It's not just about we need to have, because uh, if you're talking about one out of every hundred rapes resulting yeah. in a conviction in 99 that aren't, if you put that amount of people, that 99%, through the justice system as it is right now, there wouldn't be resources to cope with that. It's simply not actually feasible. Yeah. And so there has to be these other kind of situations. You can't have three year court cases for every single person. There has to be a host of different solutions. And that's what the Law Commission review will hopefully suggest. It's not just one thing. And also suggestions have been made by Toa Nest. They have been made by Rape Prevention Education. These suggestions have been made, made and they need to be implemented urgently by government because it is nothing less than a public health crisis. I can't say that enough. So many people are affected. If 33% of women have actually been affected by sexual violence, that's, that means everybody's been affected. Uh, let's wrap the show. Keith, final word this week. Your final word? Oh, I didn't have a final word, but I, I think that it's important to um, really fight against this bill that's going through Parliament, the Video Surveillance Bill, and also the Passports Act uh, part of it, in that taking away a passport of a New Zealander is taking away a fundamental right guaranteed in the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights and guaranteed in our Bill of Rights because the right to leave New Zealand and come back, uh, you know, if you haven't committed a crime and aren't part of the justice system, is something that should not be breached. Jesse, your final word? Well, I guess a couple of final words. One thing is about the situation with Key and Collins, and I think if we allow people to be rewarded by this kind of behaviour that sends a really problematic message and uh, you know we don't want a society like that and I think that's when they do need to be called on their behaviour and held accountable. Um, and I also think in regards to the sexual violence issues that, um, that we need to uh, really see these changes being made under urgency and we really need to be watching the government, holding them accountable, continuing to rally and continuing to put pressure, all of us together, on them to make the changes that need to be made in order for justice to be upheld. 
Thank you both very much. Uh, my final word this week, Andrew Little. Wow, what a performance. <laughs> he has done more yeah. in six days than Goff, Shearer or Cunliffe managed to do in six years as the leader of the opposition. Uh, very interesting to see where that goes. We'll see you next week, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.